Cheers for coming, everyone. Um, we're going to spend the next few minutes talking about Argo workflows at scale. Um, I'm going to try and give you some kind of general advice and tips and all that sort of stuff. And Alec here will give you his real world experiences at his company. Um, by way of introduction, my name's Tim. I'm um, an Argo maintainer. I live in the CNCF Argo Slack. So if you've asked an Argo workflows question, you've probably spoken to me over, over the last four years or something. Um, I am growing a moustache to annoy my wife. Yeah, and hey, I'm Alec. I work at Fetch Analytics, and I've been working on Argo workflows the last about six months or so. Um, yeah, a bit interested in this high throughput computing, data engineering, data science kind of world, and yeah, get up to lots of other activities in my spare time. Navigate this. Just need this one. Um, very briefly about PipeKit, uh, we offer two main services. So we, we offer services on Argo workflows. So if you need support on Argo or infrastructure and things like that, we're more than happy to help you. Um, we also offer a product that sits on top of Argo, um, just helps you with scaling, uh, does cool things like multi-cluster, um, making RBAC just less sucky and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and we're at Fetch Analytics. We're interested in how people move um, through the physical world. Um, and kind of giving those insights to our clients who come from various different angles at that. Uh, the one problem I like is trying to work out where's the best place to place a coffee shop in a given area. But uh, we've also got transport use cases, um, people interested in their, their clientele, people planning high streets, managing historic monuments, etc. Yeah, we're active in these five different areas. And yeah, startup, so we're scaling. So yeah, how does Argo fit in with our business? Well, the, the core of our company is this uh, pipeline that runs twice a week. It's got about more than 500 billion records. Um, and essentially, we've got these algorithms that we've written that help derive the mobility patterns to surface this information. Um, yeah, if you rewind six months ago, they were kind of reliable, unreliable. Um, we had this feeling that they could be potentially better or faster. Um, and then like the image on the right, it was kind of a bit not transparent as to what was actually going on under the hood. Um, so yeah, then we kind of embarked on this last couple of months of improving and, and want to share some of those insights that we've had along the way. So I'm a data scientist by trade, so I guess the official term would be like a parameter grid search for optimizing our workflow. Um, we ran about 66 different experiments, it was super costly. Um, had kind of came down to about 15 different regressors or things that we're tuning and changing and experimenting with. Um, yeah, some of the important ones were looking at thread usage, um, looking at how we tune the pods, the, the different nodes, types of storage options, um, how we gave data to each pod per, and how many chunks of uh, data we give to each pod uh, for a specific run type, and then machine specs. And yeah, essentially we're monitoring uh, pipeline runtime as our main metric. Um, also looking at you know improving reliability, reducing cost. Uh, yeah, and then I guess the headline results were that we've got much more reliable, much more consistent, deterministic pipeline. We know what we're going to get when we run it. Uh, the test uh, pipeline that we were using, we got down from four hours to one hour, which was really handy. And our CTO said that he can sleep in on Sunday, so I think that's a, a good result. So before we look at how to scale Argo workflows, it's probably worth just briefly explaining what happens in a basic life cycle of a workflow. So you, you get your manifest and you shove it into your cluster somehow, you know, Argo CLI or kubectl or something like that. Um, you're going via the Kubernetes API to get that manifest into etcd. The workflow controller kind of wakes up at that point, realizes you've popped something in there and starts doing workflow controller stuff. Um, so it starts asking the Kubernetes API to create your pods and starts kind of just monitoring all that. And all of that's going through the Kubernetes API with lots of back and forth, lots of calls, um, which at scale gets very noisy and very scary quite quickly. Um, on top of that, the controller is writing back the state of all your steps in your workflow back to the manifest um, in etcd. 
And of course, if you're a user using the UI to look at your workflow, that's also going through the Kubernetes API, looking at the manifest, basically rendering the manifest into nice pretty blobs on, on the screen for you. So there's, there's a lot of chatter that goes on just to create even quite a simple um, workflow. So in terms of stuff that could break, um, in no particular order, at a high level, your Kubernetes control plane might explode. Um, your workflows manifest may get too big for SED and you get all sorts of scary errors. Um, your workflow controller and server can't handle what's being thrown at them, so you run out of resources, they keep out of memorying, that kind of stuff. Um, and lastly, your cluster itself could just not have enough nodes to do what you're asking of it and things get quite sad quite fast. So if we take them one by one, uh, if we look at the Kubernetes API, um, by default, that's quite a black box, um, especially if you're in a cloud environment. Um, the Kubernetes API is over there somewhere and Workflows is over here and you don't really see anything. Um, you need to get some sort of observability in there to be able to see what's going on, which is shown in the graphs on the right-hand side there. Um, those are the graphs that come with the, uh, the Prometheus stack. Um, I'm sure there's others out there that are equally as pretty and graphy. Um, if you don't have observability, you can look at the workflow controller logs and you'll see stuff like, I, I tried to ask the Kubernetes API to do a thing and it said no and I'll try again in 30 seconds. Those kind of log messages are a good indicator that your workflow controller is basically asking too much of the Kubernetes API. Um, and this is where the big lists start to come in, where I just try and give you some things to look at. You're going to have to go away and actually Google some of these things to, to work out what's best for you. Um, but essentially, you can, you can ask the workflow controller to back off a little bit on how often it talks to the Kubernetes API using the requeue time. Um, you can look into limiting how many workflows you're running at once using workflow parallelism. Um, there's an option to limit how many pods the workflow controller creates at uh, at each time it tries to ask for something to be created through the resource rate limit. Um, if you're on an older version of Kubernetes, you will see quite a significant advantage in going to 127 or above. Um, I think we found a threefold increase in Kubernetes API performance just by upgrading. You didn't have to do anything else other than just upgrade. Um, if the worst comes to the worst, you can throw more clusters at the problem. I know a great product that will handle that for you. Um, and you also need to consider what else you're using that cluster for. It's very rare that we see people only using a Kubernetes cluster for workflows. They usually got something else going on on that cluster as well. That something else will also be talking to the Kubernetes API and it will have its own demands. And so you need to kind of balance everything in your cluster to make sure that you're not going to break things. Yeah, something we ran into was this error at the bottom that your request entity is too high, and this is when you're exceeding the ETC limit, um, which you can, which can happen if you're trying to push how many pods you've got in your workflow. Um, it can also happen if you're trying to put data into your parameters, um, so you can consider using rewrite many disk to, to actually write those out rather than storing them in the manifest. You might have a really big workflow, so in that case, splitting them into smaller workflows is a good option. In our case, we wanted to have a lot of parallelism. We wanted to have a lot of parts. We've got quite big workflows. Um, so then we went with this option of persistence where you offload um, that manifest to a database. So looking at the workflow controller, um, if you install the controller a sensible way through the Helm chart or through the official release manifest, um, there's no resource limits or requests set on that controller out of the box. So if you've just installed it and walked away, you're in a, quite a scary position. Um, you need to go ahead and set some kind of resource requests on that controller. Unfortunately, I can't stand here and give you a magic number because uh, everyone's workflows are different, everyone's requirements are different. So you're going to have to do a bit of experimentation to find out what your magic number is. Um, and then possibly slightly controversially, I would suggest not running the controller in HA. Um, so in the example here, we've got three controllers. Um, only one of them will actually be running. The other two will be sat there dormant waiting to win a leader election. So if you, for example, request uh, uh, 10 CPUs for each controller, you're burning 30 CPU only to ever use 10 at a time. Um, you might be better off burning 15 CPU on one controller and then using priority classes to make sure that controller comes back healthy if it ever dies. 
Um, the other thing to remember is if you just won one, contro one controller, it will still try and do a leader election, even though it will always win. Um, and you could turn that off using the, the environment variable there. That will just save yet another set of API calls to the Kubernetes uh, API controller. Yeah, and then likewise with the server, if you're using the server, I recommend kind of spending some time improving that experience, get SSO up, get um, your TLS sorted. If you have a lot of workflows on the server, you're going to find it slowing down. Again, there's no magic number, depending on the size. Um, there's a delete command from Argo. It's quite useful. You can also use this TTL strategy on the manifest that will delete them for you. Um, also, a really nice one is if you set up your log aggregation, because otherwise, your, as soon as your pod dies, you lose the log. So having that link out and keeping your logs, no matter when you're going back to your workflows, super handy. You can directly, obviously, skip the whole UI, which is also another option, just use kubectl commands. And then likewise with the server, there's no default set by the official manifest. So if you've got users using the UI, you might want to set those. Me again. Um, yeah, so kind of we went on this journey of tuning the nodes and the resources, which is where we got quite a lot of performance out of. Um, first thing you're going to need is obviously monitoring to know what, what the performance is like. The top left image is basically what you want to sort of aim for, where you're using 80% of your resource utilization. You're going over that with memory or ephemeral store, you're gonna, it's going to break. And if you're going over that with CPU, things will slow down. Um, bottom right image, you can see we've got two steps there that have got quite different uh, resource requirements. So in that case, it made sense for us to split those up, put them on different nodes, tune them accordingly, so save some money, um, and give them exactly what they need. And then you can see there's one node that's going wild there. That was our workflow controller, which wasn't tuned. So also, as Tim was saying, tune that, and that'll also have some performance impacts on your, your, your workflows. Yeah, and then lastly, just to look at what else is running, um, uh, you know, your, your other metrics on the pods and, uh, you know, any sidecars or drivers that might also be draining resources and causing things to slow down. So onto Kubernetes nodes. Um, hopefully you're auto-scaling. If you're in the cloud, please auto-scale. Um, in case you're not aware, if there's a node attached to your cluster, you're paying for it, whether it's being used 100% or being used 0%, you're paying for all of it. So um, the important thing here is really to turn them off when you're not using them, rather than, rather than anything else. Um, we scale down to zero at night and at weekends. It's definitely doable. Um, in terms of pods pending, um, a good indicator is the the um, image that I mocked up on the right-hand side there. If you've got your pods pending for a long time, there's something a bit iffy. Maybe you're not scaling fast enough, but maybe your images are big. Uh, maybe you're not caching your images well. There's, there's a whole rabbit hole to go down there. There's a whole talk in that. But um, basically, try and avoid the yellow blobs. Um, do whatever you can to make the yellow blobs go away. Slightly on a tangent, just in terms of cost saving, do consider using ARM over AMD64. We use 100% 100 ARM in our cluster. Argo Workflows works well with ARM. Um, obviously, depending on what you're running in your workflows, that's where the things might get a bit trickier. Um, but you should see a significant cost saving if you're in the cloud using ARM over AMD64. Um, and hopefully, most people know about Spot instances by now, but Spots is significantly cheaper at the risk of your, your node being pulled out from under your feet within two minutes. So you obviously need to write your workflows in a way that they can handle the surprise eviction event. Um, but it's definitely doable. We do the same. We're 100% SWAT, 100% ARM. Um, it definitely can be done. Yeah, and then something to kind of draw your attention to and think about is how you structure your algorithms in a way that you can uh, scale horizontally and quite easily. And fundamentally, you have your, obviously you've got kind of thread level is your lowest level of parallelism that you've got to work with. Um, but you want to start thinking about, you know, how practically you can you can make that easy for yourself to just go horizontal with more and more pods, um, given the right um, the right resources and the right data per per process that you're running. 
Um, yeah, so that can inform quite a lot of other decisions, which nodes you choose, um, how long running do you want your pods to be. Ideally, you don't want them to die after a very long time, and then you lose all of that progress. Also, thinking about whether you're running very small workflows or just large workflows, and maybe you want your small workflows to use your full cluster um, while not uh, affecting how your large workflows uh, work. That was um, hopefully by now we've kind of got the point across that you really need observability in your cluster to have any chance of scaling workflows. Um, so hopefully we have a few things here that should help you on that journey. Um, there has been a long-standing uh, Grafana dashboard for Argo. Um, it's pretty long in the tooth, doesn't work with the latest version of Grafana, doesn't really give you all the metrics you need. Um, so we just spent a bit of time polishing it up. So it's the exact same graph, uh, sorry, the exact same dashboard as it was before, but it works, which is kind of important. Um, so feel free to download it. If you've got observability stack already, you can just plug it in, um, get running with it, obviously tweak it to your own needs. It's there, just use it, basically. In terms of the future, um, my colleagues at Pipekit have um, started work already on enhancing the metrics coming in Argo workflows. We hope for 3.6, but you know, I'm not going to promise anything. Um, we have basically ripped out the old ones and put in some new ones. Um, there's some questionable things in the old ones, um, which we don't have a lot of time to go into today. Um, but hopefully the new ones will, will give you the kind of answers to the questions that you really need answered. Um, as you can see on the screen there, I won't repeat them, but the, the bottom graph um, is showing how long a workflow template takes to run across multiple workflows. Um, so it gives you an average of how long your, your template takes. Uh, in the top corner, um, the reasons why your pods are stuck in pending. So you can start to see, oh, okay, I've got an image pool problem, or I've got a scaling problem, or, you know, it just starts to hopefully give you the, the better picture um, straight out of uh, the workflows controller. Um, the proposal link is there. We'd love a thumb up. We'd love some comments, all that kind of stuff. As I say, it's, it's in the works. Hopefully we'll get it out soon. And then if you don't have observability, I do appreciate that's quite a scary thing to take on. Observability is not, you know, it's not a quick thing to just roll out. Um, the, the quote at the top is from a recent Grafana um, study that they did. You should have observability, do invest in it. Um, but hopefully we can help you on that journey. Um, we have written this free plugin that you just plug into your cluster. It gathers exactly the metrics you need for your Argo workflows, and you can just see them on a dashboard, and you can start to see some of the answers to the things that we just went through today. Um, I'll show it to you really briefly. And the internet sucks, so what I've done is loaded it in separate tabs. I'm not going to hit refresh. Um, so this is an actual cluster. Um, I've been desperately running some random jobs just to try and get some spikes and some graphs. Um, so this, this first page, show you everything um, about the workflows controller itself. So it's showing successful um, workflows and the failed or errored workflows, as well as what the inside of the um, controller looks like. So how many things are being added to the controller's queue, um, the depth of things in the queue. So if we've got a problem, we'll start to see those lines go up and not come down. Um, this cluster looks fine. The Kubernetes control plane will be in here as well, so you can start to, again, see if your control plane is crying, it will really cry on this graph, um, and you'll see it at a glance. And the same, you can see all the queues and things like that within the API itself. You can then see your workflows pods. Um, the, you can see pending versus running pods. So if you see a large spike of pending, and it takes a long time for them to turn into running, then that's when you can start to see that you've got some kind of scaling issue. And in fact, this large spike here is when I made the screenshot a few slides back um, showing all the pending um, pods. And lastly, looking at Kubernetes nodes, how many nodes have you got? Are they scaling up and down? So this particular cluster scales down to four when it's doing nothing and spikes all the way up to, I don't know, 30-ish when it's doing some work. And as Alex said, you want to kind of aim for, really, you want to aim to use as much of your nodes as possible because you're paying for all of them anyway. In this particular cluster, we're doing a pretty bad job. Um, we're not using much of the, of the CPU at all, and the memory is a little bit low. So we, we've got some work here. We can now see at a glance that we need to do something in our cluster to, to try and get the best um, economy out of them. Um, we hope to have this out very soon. Please just um, register on the quick link there. 
um, we'll get in touch with you in a couple of weeks. Um, as I say, it's completely free. The collector itself is open source. You can see all the code. You can see all the data that's being collected. Everything we collect, we show back to you. There's no, you know, there's nothing hidden there. We just want to help people just get the best out of workflows. Yeah, so that was a key sort of summary of our kind of findings, but definitely key theme of getting observability up was kind of pivotal. So having Prometheus, CubeState metrics, Argo, custom metrics, all super useful. Um, yeah, some other kind of tips were using NFS, a network file store. Tim's got a great talk uh, on that, worth checking out if you haven't seen it. Getting rid of uh, lifecycle hooks was, was quite important because we'd often have, we'd have a screen like you saw earlier with a bunch of green uh, where things would actually be failing under the hood. So getting rid of those is, is worth it. And then also just investing in some tooling that we hadn't come across. So making things more dry with customize, um, also controlling cost with uh, low environments using uh, cheaper storage versus production using the high-end NMS, and K9s is super useful if you haven't come across it, and latest version of Argo is also obviously good. Um, yeah, so those optimizations are what kind of got us this much more performant at uh, various levels of pod and node level, a uh, quarter of the time, and yeah, knowing what we're gonna get each time is, is, is super valuable. We just collected all the stuff we've mentioned basically onto one slide just to make it a little bit easier. I won't go through them all again. Um, these slides will be available on the top link. There are extra slides in here that we didn't have time to talk about today. So if you want to go into a little bit more depth, there's something to look at. Um, in terms of PipeKit, we're more than happy to listen and help wherever we can. So we're, we're on booth E34. We're happy to hear your open source questions and, and try and answer them. We do regular office hours to do exactly that. Just sign up, turn up, and throw questions at us and watch us cry sometimes when we're not quite sure what to do. Um, but yeah, do just turn up and get help. That's what we're here for. Yeah, and likewise, if you're interested in um, this data and the story of kind of human movement, uh, come reach out to us because that's, that's what we do. Thank you. Thank you.